are in uh, Proverbs chapter 21, and we are beginning, uh, I have five Proverbs for us this morning, hope to get through all of those, beginning in verse 17, and let me ask you to set a tab at uh, two other texts of scripture that I'm going to use to supplement our lesson this morning. Uh, that first is 2 Timothy chapter 1, and the second is Psalm 49, a psalm that we studied together for about three weeks back several years ago, and I think that they will add clarity to the Proverbs that we have before us this morning. Well, here is the translation that I have put together, beginning in Proverbs 21 and verse 17. The one who loves pleasure is a destitute person, and the one who loves wine and oil will never become rich. 18. A wicked person is a ransom for the righteous, and a treacherous person, now look at these words because they're really essential for understanding this proverb, comes in the place of, so it is an exchange, there's a transaction here, and that's essential for understanding this proverb. So a wicked person is a ransom for the righteous, and a treacherous person comes in the place of the upright. It's almost like our substitutionary atonement. That's the idea, only this is a switcheroo, if you will, of the righteous person being under condemnation and suddenly he is not, and the wicked are in their place. Here is 19. Better to dwell in a desert land than to dwell with a contentious and vexing wife. Now, I need to say, because we have so many lovely ladies here this morning, I know that this is a, a one-sided Proverb, it is all the condemnation is pointed toward the unwise or foolish woman. I actually uh, really enjoy reading uh, a satire that comes out once a week, a blog, and it is written by a lovely lady in her 60s and she calls herself Ammo Girl. That's G-I-R-R-R-L. And uh, she wrote on Wicked Husbands one time. I thought it was quite humorous. So I just want you to know I'm well aware that this is pointed in one direction. It's the proverb, and we're going to teach it as it is. Uh, here is 20, a desirable supply of food and oil are in the dwelling place of the wise, but the fool gulps his down. And then the final proverb for the morning, verse 21, the man who pursues righteousness and kindness will find life, prosperity, and honor. Well, here's the way I'm going to teach these Proverbs this morning. Uh, verse 17, true riches come in a way not foreseen. True riches come in a way not foreseen. Of course, that is the righteous person. The person who pursues covenant faithfulness, kindness, and righteousness. 18, 
the great exchange from death to life for the benefit of the righteous. The great exchange from death to life for the benefit of the righteous. And 19, the contentious wife who is more deadly than the outdoor elements. The contentious wife who is more deadly than the outdoor elements. And then 20, instant gratification is the way of the fool. Instant gratification is the way of the fool. And finally, verse 21, in the daily pursuit of faithfulness, we find the big thing. In the daily pursuit of faithfulness, we find the big things. Well, here is our exposition beginning in verse 17. In wisdom, the skill for living identifies a number of causes for poverty. We have already seen and studied the sluggard who refused to work. And here is another It's overindulgence. It is what our society is truly all about, chasing pleasure. The opening here, the top line, the one who loves pleasure. Now, that's really the word joy, translated pleasure. We've studied this word before in the book of Proverbs. Actually, verse 15, the doing of of justice here. It brings joy. And we even referenced the use of the word by Jonah's big leafy plant that appeared suddenly over his bald head to shade him. It brought him joy. And then I want you to notice that joy here is balanced by line two, the love of wine and olive oil. Now, I want to step away from the proverb just a moment, and I want to give a personal word of testimony about joy and what happened in my life and its relevance to this class. About five years ago, my wife and I were regular attenders of a restaurant down in Oklahoma City, downtown. And there we met a young, attractive black girl who was in her early 20s, and we struck up kind of a friendship, certainly an association with her, knew her by her first name, and got to know her background and family and so forth. And then came that day when she, through some point of conversation, uh, that she was homosexual. Well, I got weak in the knees. I, I, you could have hit me in the face with a snow shovel. And my wife, who is much brighter and has a much bigger ministry than me, she looked at me like water off a duck's back and said, that's just the age we're in. I said, oh, we've got to do something. We've got to do something here. We've got to begin to pray and then And here's the plan. I'm going to get her alone, one-on-one, take her to lunch. That's what I'll do. And uh, I'll be all prepared. And that's exactly what happened. I was all prepared. Had my envelope, had my book, had my sheet of verses, and I had a letter that I read to her because I didn't want to leave anything out. And uh, it was a pleasant time. Then my wife got cancer, and that was three years, and then COVID came, that's another two years, and so five years have gone by. And on New Year's Eve night, we go back to that same restaurant, hadn't been there in five years, and we made the reservations early because we had grandchildren to take care of, so we actually went in about 4.30, and we were so early, we were 
the earliest in the restaurant. And who should be there to greet us? Now she had changed, she had a nose ring now, and now she's bleached her hair, it's just white. And, uh, but she recognized us and came over and we exchanged pleasantries and, and she would, as the restaurant filled up, she would still come back to the table and talk to us. A very pleasant person. Um, and then she announced to us uh, that she wanted to get married and was hoping to get married this year to another woman. And uh, I looked at her uh, before we were leaving as she was moving throughout the restaurant. And my heart just filled with this word, joy. I can't explain it. Just, it's just bursting with joy. And I reached in my pocket, pulled out some, who knows how many bills, and just walked over there and pressed them into her hand and told her how good it was to see her again, that I always wanted to have a relationship with her no matter what. I got in the car and we're driving home and I told my wife exactly what I'd done and she looked at me and she said, well, that's not like you. That's not like you at all. And, uh, I said, I know, I know, what's, what's gotten into me? But you see, she hadn't changed, but I had changed. And uh, you get up the next morning and you think, did I do the right thing? I mean, I'm just an old bald man, and have she probably look, looks at me like I'm a fool and a stooge. And then came Sunday school. This class, last week, Mark's exposition, Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 27, regarding Levi, the tax collector. And, uh, and Mark pointed out, you know, the once he stepped away from that collection of taxes. The fishermen among the disciples, they could always go back to fishing, but he was cut off. This was permanent. And then remember his exposition last week, the banquet? What did Levy do? He blew open the doors. He pulled open the windows. He turned on all the lights. And he had his home packed full of sinners and tax collectors. There they were. And Jesus, the Christ, was right in the middle of it all. And that's when I got my clarity. You see, I realized, looking at that, I was standing right next to Levy. Who cares what she thought? Who cares what I did? It was all with a, a great motive. I was the representative of the Christ. I was the party. And where she's headed and the way she's going is just death and disappointment and destruction. You know, Mark, I, I don't know who you thought your audience was last week and the hours of preparation that you put into that message. But I want you to know something. I want everybody to know something. That that message last week was all intended for me because it brought me clarity. It brought me understanding. And... That's why you are at Believer's Chapel. Not for robes and candles and crosses and stained glass windows. It's for the Word of God. Because this is what changes you. Not those external things. They don't sanctify you at all. It is the 
teaching ministry of the word born by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now let me illustrate what I mean by that. I, I know I've given you this illustration before, but bear with me if you've heard it. Uh, I have, we had Dr. Bruce Walkie come to Oklahoma City on a Friday night, and then he came down to Dallas, and he taught at Believer's Chapel. And so the meetings were in conjunction to his trip. And he, his message was, the who, what, where, when, and why of wisdom from the book of Proverbs. You might remember it. And, uh, and in Oklahoma City that Friday night, when that message was over, I had this acquaintance, very wealthy guy. Uh, he's a big game hunter. He built a, a wing onto his house, and it loaded with bears and antelopes and and you're, you think you're in a zoo when you walk in there. Uh, and he, he comes over to me. His eyes are scarlet red. His chin is quivering. And he said, I need to talk to you. I thought, my goodness, what in the world has happened? He said, I need to... Have you hold me accountable for what I am about to do? I'm going to go home. I'm going to put my wife in her favorite chair. And I'm going to get down on my knee. And I'm going to say to her, forgive me for my self-indulgence and my self-centeredness for all of these years, putting you and the girls aside for all of my calendar filled with my hunting trips. Now, I'm going to tell you, I, I just listened to that message. I took notes. My hand was about to fall off. I'd written so hard. And I never heard one time the word hunting, or fishing, or outdoors, or guns, but you see, the Word of God as it was presented and by the power of the Holy Spirit, it launched to its target and it hit dead center. That's what we do here. That's what these elders and the deacons are committed to here. It is the Word of God as it goes out and it always, always hits home and never returns void. So, I came to this word joy and I thought, you know, Lord, what should I do? I'm so far behind in Proverbs and he told me, just teach it. So that's what I did. And that's where we are. I want you to notice joy here. It's uh, balanced in line two with the love of wine and oil, which are negative consequences, love, pleasure. That's the result of line one is destitute. The word means need or poverty. Literally, our text reads, a man of poverty. So line two is the predilections of the fool here. Wine and oil, symbols of festive pleasure. The wine for drinking, the oil for anointing the body. They are great features of joy in the New Testament. But when they are chased and become an end in themselves, they are, have a very deleterious effect upon the person. And so here we have in the proverb, the consequences from the book of consequences. And here's the sad payoff. Look at this verb, become. 
It's a movement word. It literally means grow to be. It's a transactional word, if you would. So the Proverbs have taught us in the past that man is never in neutral. He is always moving one direction or the other. He is either becoming more and more wise, or he is becoming more and more of the callous fool and ultimately the mocker who is the hardened man at all. So, here are the benefits of being wise. The consequences, from the book of consequences. I asked these young businessmen on Friday mornings in my Bible study in Oklahoma City, you want to be rich? I got their attention. You want to be rich from the scriptures? Let me give it to you. Give what you have away. And you'll become rich. That doesn't involve just money. That's your talent. That's your time. That's your energy. That is whatever fills your 24-hour day. Give it away. And give it away freely. And then you'll be made rich in ways beyond your comprehension. That's what Proverbs teaches. That's the scriptures. I'm reading the history of the Protestant Reformation. I think I've told you that. And I'm just about to the end. And one of the things that has really arrested my attention. Oh yeah, you have the tanners and the cobblers and the, then the, the men who make shoes. And, and they become believers and... They have a real bracing testimony. But what has really caught my attention is all of these people of wealth and power and prestige that have put it all out there for the Reformation because they were born again. And you see, they had a lot to live for. Not all the trappings of a good life, a comfortable life, a prestigious life, but they tossed it to the wind for the Reformation. And they, they turned all of Europe upside down. I said to these young men, I want you to play the bigger game. The bigger game, not the game of the physical trappings of this world. No, I want you to play the big game. And here it is. And this is why I wanted you to set a tab on the text. It's 2 Timothy 1.9. It's what S. Lewis Johnson called the immensities. That's the text. And here it is. He saved us. Now, let's just go through that. He saved us. He saved us when? Well, according to the apostle, to the Ephesians, that was eternity past. What was that? I don't know. You and I don't know. We don't have any frame of reference for what that phrase means. Eternity past. That's what he did. He saved us. And then, look, here's space and time. This is our lives. Look at the word called. Called us. And what did He call us to? A life of separation. Holy. Sanctification. Set apart. That's who we are. We have been set apart from the world, from society. You are no longer the person that you once were. You have been delivered from that life to a new life, a vibrant life. And just to make sure that we are 
Paul thinking like the apostle. It has nothing to do with you, he tells us. Look, not because of works. There's nothing you've done. Look, his own purpose and grace. The history of you is not about you. It's about him. It's about what he has doing in your life. He brought you from the, the fires of darkness and death and destruction and now has placed you on the solid rock and he has lit up all of reality. That's what the apostle's telling us here. And it's all because of him. Look at the verb. He gave. You didn't give. He gave. He did it all. It's all about him. And to be specific, it is the person of Jesus the Christ. The Messiah. That's who you're linked to. And then the last three words, look at them. Before time began. Before time began. What's that? Well, Dr. Johnson called it the immensities. Jesus Christ, in space and time, under the plan of God from eternity past, He stepped in to your reality. He took you by the hand and He placed you in the enormity of what we now call His kingdom. And it's bigger, grander than anything your eye has ever seen or ear will ever hear. How do you explain to an ant the Himalayas or the Rocky Mountains? How do you explain to a small snail crawling along your window seal in the backyard, the Atlantic or Pacific Ocean. You can't. They have nothing to relate to. You and I have nothing to relate to. But that is what he has done. For his own purpose and for by his own grace. The immensity. Now, in 2022, here we are together. You may have sung your last Christmas carol. You may have wrapped your last package. You may have put up and taken down the tree for the last time. Who knows? I had a friend who went to sleep in 2021, and he didn't wake up in 2022. And the testimony from his wife, she never heard a thing. He never reached for her. She never heard a gasp in the night. But he was gone in the morning. Gone to Christ. So, live your life for the immensities. Give your self away, your time, your energy, your talent, your money, whatever you've got to possess, give it away and give it away freely. And in so doing, you're going to find you're going to be given more and more and more because he's no man's debtor. That's the immensities that you have stepped into. That's the reality of the new life that you and I have in Christ Jesus. Here it is. Our Lord Jesus Himself. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 39. Give away your life, He said. And in so doing, you're going to find it. See, you and I, as unregenerates, we were living in the matchbox. Thinking 
We had really done something, achieved something. We were responsible people of the matchbox. And then suddenly he blows open the doors in Levy's house and the lights are on. And suddenly everything is new and vibrant. That's where you and I are in 2022 today. Now here's 18. A wicked person is a ransom for the righteous. The previous proverb declared the pleasures of the fool will never keep him from true riches. But now here, look, this proverb is the wicked is a ransom and taking the exchange of the place of the righteous person. It's really an observation of how God has set up the world to make it work. It's a very difficult proverb. So let's try to go through it carefully and with some scriptural illustrations. The The term ransom is a figure for compensation, to pay a penalty, used to free a prisoner, to save a life. It can't possibly be literal. That's what makes the proverb so difficult. Because you see, the righteous person who is in the place of danger has nothing that they're guilty of. And so they don't have really any debt to pay. So the figure here represents the righteous as just in the place of danger. Line one, the wicked person, he plotted it out. But the righteous are innocent. And so the top line declares that a wicked person, by providence, he has stepped into the place or the penalty or ransom and thus setting the righteous person free. The Cambridge scholar Derek Kidner, he calls the wicked here expendable. No matter what you think that they own and how powerful they are, they're expendable, said Kidner in the proverb. So, we don't really have any context, so let's try to create one to make the proverb come alive. Line two, but this treacherous fool, in reality, is going to find that God in his providence is going to turn the tables on him. Because he rules and reigns, and not wicked men. You see, the Proverbs say you can't get away with wickedness. There's always going to be a payday out there. And that's what we have. And so the tables are suddenly turned on the wicked, and they end up where the righteous once were, in the place of danger. Now, here's one illustration, and then I want to give you one in much more detail, showing you the exchange. The Pharaoh of Exodus chapter 1, remember him? He ordered that all the male babies of God's chosen people would be drowned in the Nile. And yet, what did we learn in history? It was actually the, uh, the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh's wicked charioteers were the ones that actually got drowned. And you remember Pharaoh, he, he's the one that gave the order for the male babies to all be drowned in the Nile. And yet it was Pharaoh's own voice, the tenth plague, remember? That struck down all the firstborn male babies of the Egyptians. That's the proverb. It's an exchange. That's what's going on. It's an observation of reality. Here's another more detailed explanation. Psalm 49, we looked at it a few years back. 
Just briefly, I want to look at it again because it explains exactly what the proverb is saying. The arrogant rich, they seemingly hold all the cards to life. They have peace and happiness and well-being and they call the shots in this life. That's who they are. That's what their wealth has brought them. But then something happens along the way. And here it is, verse 12. Look, they die. Now, we would think that they're going to go on for a thousand years, like the Third Reich. But they die. They don't last very long. See that word pomp? That's man in his magnificence. And the scriptures say he doesn't last. He doesn't endure. He is like, there's your word of comparison, see? He's like the beast of the field. Well, he's just like a cow out there. He's like an old dead animal out in the wilderness someplace. That's what he's like. The beast that perishes. The great rich, they end up like the beast in the field. Now look at verse 13. Here is your skill. Here is wisdom being taught to us. This is the way, look what the words, you understand that word. Your past, your present, and your future. It is the decisions that you make every day. That is your way. And this is their way, the way of the foolish and those after them who approve their words. Foolish meaning they're stupid, they have presumptuous confidence, but it's confidence all in the wrong thing. They all will tell you that they know they're going to die. That's why they spend amounts of money on trusts and wills and make all these elaborate plans for their things. They they buy their burial lots, and they've all paid up to Ed C. Smith and Brothers' family security plan. They have no concerns about that. And we would say, well, that's very prudent. You're very wise. But they're not wise. Watch them. Listen to them. Listen to the way they talk. Cursing God. The profanity that comes from their heart. You see, they know they're going to die, but every day they get up, they act like they're going to live forever. Why? Cursing God, I'm never going to face Him, and by the time I do, He'll have forgotten about it. That's their mentality. He grades on the curve. I'm a good person. I've done good things. I've given to the United Way. I built a, a floor on the hospital. That's man. Look at the second line here. And every man that follows the pompous example. Those are willing followers. Those are people of the world. Your friends and neighbors. And what do they say? Well, here's what they say, the wisdom of the crowd. Well, he's got no problems. He should have no concern. He's got it made. Made for what? Well, the psalm's going to tell us. I can remember having a lunch. I was invited to a lunch by four oil men downtown Oklahoma City. And uh, the conversation, you know, going in every direction, and then suddenly, this man said, well, what does he have to worry about? Every night, he goes to bed with $145 million, referring to his wealthy wife. He's got no problems. He's got no worries. You see, that's what the, pro the, the psalm is saying. That's the pompous arrogance of the fools. It's all about mammon. It's all about... The here and the now. But look, 
at the psalmist. Look at the sons of Korah. Look what they say. Verses 14 and 15. Here is your proverb. 21.18. It's the turning of the tables. It's the providential exchange. And here is the way they explain it to us. As sheep, remember now, we started verse 12. They were called the pompous beast. Remember? In verse 14, here is this word appointed. NIV, you have destined. It is literally meaning to place. And here's the use of the verb. It's Psalm 3 and verse 6. Enemies called by David as people who have, and here's our verb from the New American Standard, set themselves. In other words, they are in a place by their decisions. It's the word, distant, pointed, placed. And the psalm said, placed for the grave, placed for death. We have a shopping center in North Oklahoma City called the Class and Curve. It actually follows around a circle and it curves around. And so at Christmas, you're driving down the road and you see this shopping center and this all of these lights, green and red, vibrant. That's life. That's activity. That's commerce. That's where people do business. That's where they eat and drink and they gather together. That is the class and curve. But right across the street, right across the street on the other side of the curve, it's all dark. It's all desolate. There's no one there. It's a cemetery. Now, I've never, I've never seen Christmas lights in a cemetery. No, that's Sheol, the place of darkness. And that's where they're headed. That is where they have been placed in darkness. Look, death, verse 14, it's going to be their shepherd. They were the people in control. They made all the decisions. But now look at them. They're just common sheep. What do we know about sheep? Well, they're led by shepherds. What do shepherds do? They lead, they feed, they tend. And the fool here, do you see it? It's not his call anymore. He's being led and fed and tended to. But by who? By death. No way out. The place of darkness and gloom. You see, death has skillfully turned into a figure who rules in another domain. And that domain is what we don't see. We don't see it. And here's the exchange, verse 15. The upright, let's add the word skillful, wise. Look, they're going to rule now. You see that? They're going to rule over them. And they're going to do it in the morning. Meaning, meaning a, a new place, a new dispensation. It's what... You and I don't have. I don't have tomorrow. You don't have tomorrow. I have right now. I have this moment. But in the morning, that's a brand new dispensation. That's what's going to happen. It's a figure for new, a different realm. It's a place of light and life and activity. It's the shopping center on Class and Curve. And... Here's the way the apostle puts it for us. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Where he is, we shall be forever with him. We're in the lights. We're in the activity. We're in the immensities of it all. And we'll see it. And we won't need a Hubble telescope. 
we'll be able to see it with our own eyes and it will be our reality. So my friends, that's where we are. 2022, the beginning of the year, that's where we are, that's who we are. Now, let's live it. Let's live it up with great vigor and energy, not knowing any of us how much time we have left. But let's live it to the full. And let's make the most of our days for Him and for His kingdom. And that's the proverb. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this time of study this morning. Thank you for this class, for the leadership of this church, the stewardship of the elders and the deacons that are here, and the opportunity that we have one to another to give ourselves away for you, for there is no other cause in all of life greater than you. You are God our Savior. You are the friend of Levy. You are in the midst of sinners and the wicked, calling them to the light. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.